Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, my name is Tony. I'm an alcoholic. This is a fun place. <laughs> Alonzo said that the world's a safer place that we're all in here. Just think what would happen if we all took a drink tonight. <laughs> We'd take Laguna upon. <laughs> I never drank like that before. Oh. Anyway, my name's Tony, I'm an alcoholic. Um, it's funny how, how the mind works and how everything, how thinking works. I got sober, um, on the 29th, 1975, and the speaker that night was Chuck C, and he lived around here, and some of you I know knew him. And uh, my life was transformed, my life was changed that night. Um, all the newcomers, welcome. What happened to me was, uh, you know, I, I, I have no linear way of, I never know what I'm going to say. But when I came in here tonight, it all came back to me. Sometimes you go through patches, I like go through patches where everything just becomes kind of easy. And I came in here tonight and uh, I don't know why, but I heard it all over again, freshly as if I was back 25, almost 25 years ago. And I don't know what that's about, but hearing the chapter 5 being read, the traditions, and seeing people coming up here, it reminds me back of the old days. Because now I'm an old timer. <laughs> but I remember the heady experience of when I came into AA that night, and I didn't want to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. But uh, I came into that meeting on that night on the Pacific Palisades Group. It was on the 29th, it was a Monday night. And Chuck C. was speaking that night, and uh, there was another man speaking, he was a doctor from Palos Verdes. And he looked like an alcoholic to me, and he sounded like an alcoholic. He said, my name an alcoholic, and he sounded like, oh. He looked like something from the last weekend. <laughs> and I think he was a surgeon, he was a doctor, and I think he said his moment of truth was when he came to in the middle of an operation. <laughs> And the theater sister said, no, Doc, you've got to sew her up, because she was going to operate again. <laughs> and everyone laughed, and I thought they're all crazy, this, you know. But that's what got me sober, and uh, laughter and fun. And uh, I was swept away by this whole thing, because I wasn't a joiner. And the ironic thing is, whatever the higher power is, or God, whatever you want to call it, he, she, or it, um, ground of all being collective consciousness, whatever it is, God, uh, has a very strange sense of humor, because I never joined anything. Um, I drank because I didn't like people, I drank because I didn't like crowds. I wasn't exactly a lone drinker, but I, uh, I was a lonely person, I was a lonely man, and, uh, and I kidded myself that I was a loner. Um, my heroes were Humphrey Bogart and uh, John Barrymore and all those people, and the writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald all died of this chronic illness. Those are my heroes. And uh, I thought they were very clever, and I thought I was clever. But um, the ironic thing was, being a loner and hating crowds, I never joined anything. I wouldn't join a club. And how should I get sober, but it was to be swept away by the crowd or by the mass enthusiasm of that first night when somebody got up and said my name is Chuck, I'm an alcoholic and everyone said hi Chuck and uh, I was engulfed in this wave of life because that's what it was, I'd been avoiding it all my life, ever since I was a little kid I felt like I was on an offshore island with a pair of high powered binoculars looking at the mainland, you know, and that was my life I never joined in anything I was born in South Wales there's a good reason to be a drunk <laughs> 
all the Welsh are drunks, you know. The Welsh were the Irish who couldn't swim. <laughs> and I had an idyllic child, you know, my, my first few years, and then I went to school for, and I, I knew I was on the wrong planet. Because... I didn't know what they were talking about. I sat at the back of the class in my school. My whole school career, I had one expression on my face. <laughs> That's how I viewed the world. I didn't know what was going on. All my life, until I came to this program, I thought... I heard my father say to my mother once, in the next door bedroom, he said, there's something very radically wrong with this boy. <laughs> Which isn't a way to encourage your son to grow up with confidence, you know. So I felt radically wrong. There's something wrong with me. I, I just probably was, as they say, maybe dyslexic or ADD or whatever these newfangled words are. I was just stupid. <laughs> I was a dummy. Because I didn't know what they were talking about. I had no idea. My first encounter with God was from Miss Thomas, who was our school teacher, and she made us say the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I didn't know what she was talking about. When she said, Our Father, I thought she'd been in heaven. I thought she died, and I didn't know what to make of this. <laughs> and the Lord is my shepherd and all that stuff. And I remember going home, my father said, There's a load of rubbish. Don't believe in all that nonsense. <laughs> and so he closed the door on my faith, because my father was a self-educated um, man, and uh, he's a great character, he's a wonderful man, but he was an atheist, or so he professed to be, he was an agnostic or an atheist, he was what he called himself a free thinker, he was a you know, Marxist, and he believed in the revolution, all that, but he uh, was angry all his life, and he was a wonderful guy, and I think, I know it's not traditional to say this about another person, but I think my father was an alcoholic uh, as well, I think he was, although his drinking patterns were a little were different to mine, he would... Um, no, they weren't that different, actually. He was a periodic drinker. When he drank, he would go through that personality change and he'd become very nasty. <clears throat> Strange. And um, I, so I guess he was. And he died 19 years ago. And um, he died in pain and uh, from heart disease. And uh, he was a frightened man. But what happened to me, I grew up. I grew, went through my life not believing in anything. And I was, because I was so slow at school... A friend of mine is here tonight, and she says, don't call yourself dumb. Well, I might just say that to get a laugh, but I think I was different, and I, I couldn't grasp anything, and I was educated into believing that I was pretty stupid, and maybe that's to do with the school or whatever. The society, uh, it was after just during the war years, and, uh, but I grew up very angry and uh, very lonely because I couldn't fit anything together. And I felt like a failure. And all I had going for me was a kind of artistic streak. I, was, I loved music, and I could play the piano, and I used to compose, and I, I could write a little, and I could draw, you know. So I had an artistic streak, which, if you're in the rugby-playing, football-playing society, it doesn't go down well, you know. <laughs> so I never played with the other kids. I was always on my own. And uh, I remember identifying with this when I heard in my first few weeks in meetings in AA, I remember all my uh, my childhood standing on the corner of the street while all the other kids were down the other end of the street all playing games. And I used to stand there like this all afternoon looking at my thumbnails. And I used to do things like that, looking through my fingers like that. <laughs> and my father would say, Where's, where is he? She, my mother would say, he's up the end of the street there. He's a very strange boy, isn't he? <laughs> What the hell is he thinking about? I didn't know what I... I don't think I was thinking about anything, really. I just didn't want to be with anyone. So being, being kind of rejected, I suppose, I'm not doing the psychoanalysis on myself, but being rejected by other school kids, because kids can be very cruel, and I couldn't play sport, I couldn't do anything. And rugby is a national Welsh game. It's, a, it's not like American football, it's a different game, but it's, it's a rough and tumble game, and I couldn't play it. And I, well, I had to go out sometimes and play, but once I caught the ball and all these guys were rushing towards me, I threw the ball up and ran off the thing. <laughs> now, in a masculine society, that doesn't bode well, I think. That. <laughs> they called me a few things. And I used to play these dirges on piano and read poetry, which again doesn't go down well. And uh, so I became, I felt very rejected, which I probably was, and I rejected myself, and so I got 
became more and more angry. And I felt like the village idiot, because that's the way I behaved. I started wearing the mask of being hopeless and helpless. And miraculously what happened, uh, about the age of 17, I left school and I had nothing else to do. And I walked into a local YMCA place, you know, and they had an amateur acting group there. And uh, I asked if I could join in. I felt comfortable for the first time. They put me on a stage and I had a small part in this play. And uh, I remember the first line, I was playing a disciple. It was about this time of the year, I think. Uh, yeah. I think it was a kind of Christmas play. And one line, blessed are the meek, for they should inherit the earth. And uh, I remember standing there thinking, I really fit in here. Sure, beats working for a living, I thought. So I decided to become an actor. And I studied, I went to college for a few years, and I did what they call, what you call the draft here. We, in England, it's called national service. I went in the army for two years, and I came out in 1960. Hadn't been at all afflicted by alcoholism as such. I never really was a heavy drinker. I had a few beers on a Saturday night, but I couldn't, didn't have the money to afford that much. And so I didn't get into any trouble, but I felt, and I'm talking about being in the military service, I mean, I felt really on the outside, but I was charmed. I had this knack of falling on my feet, like just like a cat. And I had this job as a clerk in the main office there, and I couldn't type, I couldn't do anything. I didn't know how I stayed in this job. The guy who gave me the job used to look at me with a kind of puzzled look, like, how the hell did I give you this job? He can't, he can't do anything. <laughs> and I'd be telling him, I'd look at him, and I'd be <laughs> And I'd turn around, he'd be looking at me like this. He said, how did you get, how did you get slipped through? So I was very lucky. Anyway, I came out of the army, and um, I became an actor, and I, did some more training and I got some jobs in repertory companies and all that and then in 1960 my drinking started to take a grip of me and I remember being ill and uh, I would buy anyone a drink just to win some friendship because I felt so odd and I knew that they were all laughing at me I was classically paranoid but what I was really was alcoholic chronic alcoholic in its earliest stages and in the uh, early 1960s I um I started getting into trouble with it, but I became, in a very short period of time, in about five years, I became uh, lucky. I was lucky. I, I got some pretty good jobs, and I started working in London, in the London Theatre, and the National Theatre, and I was given some pretty good stuff to do, and uh, I didn't trust anyone, and I thought, what is, what's their angle? not realizing that they're giving me a gift, that they were giving me work, because they thought I was talented. But I suspected everyone, and I would turn around and bat, bite the hand that fed me. And I was told about my drinking, and I was warned about it um, by the big cheese there. It was a guy called Lawrence Livia, and he was running this theater, and I was in it, and I was trouble. And he said to me, he said, why are you doing this? He said, you know, you're a talented guy. He said, why, why are you doing all this for? For a psychiatrist. And uh, he paid for one session with the psychiatrist. And I was told by the psychiatrist that I was suffering from some kind of creative tension. <laughs> called creative stress. Being an actor, you know, I thought, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> I said to my wife, I'm suffering from creative stress. She said, uh-huh. And so, you know, another bottle of wine. I remember when I, 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 went through, you know, I was married, my first marriage was a disaster, um, mostly my fault, and after that marriage was produced a little girl, and, and uh, I left my wife after two years, I couldn't take any more of it, we were both crazy, and then I met my second wife, and uh, we used to go out, and my second wife was a typically non-alcoholic and a very nice, decent woman, very reasonable, and I say this with all respect, not making any judgment at all, but she is different, and the non-alcoholics in this room are different <laughs> to us. Uh, we go out, and I'd have, uh, I said, do you, would you like a glass of wine? She said, yes, I'd, I'd like a wine. She'd have a glass of red wine, and so I'd order two bottles. <laughs> she said, but you want two bottles? I said, well, yeah, two of us. <laughs> she said, but, you know, I don't want a bottle. I said, why not? She said, well, I don't need it. Well, I'll drink it then. 
And she used to do those weird things. And I say this all due respect because I love non-alcoholics as well. I like non-alcoholic people. They are fascinating. They're as weird to me as that I am to them. I've been in the restaurant with them, you know, and they, with my non-alcoholic friends. And I said, do you want a bottle of wine? No, you know. I like buying, you know, making people have a good time. If they want to drink, fine. And I watch the way when the waiter comes up and they pour a little drop and they do this. Mmm, mmm, very nice. And they smoke cigarettes. They don't even inhale it. So. And I watched my wife, you know, she six o'clock every night, she has a little glass of wine, and it's on the table for about an hour. I can't take my eyes off it. And sometimes she says, didn't I have a drink? Some I say, yes, on the kitchen table. I, I know exactly what it is. Why would anyone leave it on the table? Mine was chains in my wrist. I remember after I got sober, in fact, I came back, I was, I was in New York, and I was flying back... Uh, I've been working on something in New York, and I was flying back to Los Angeles just way, way back, 1976, 77, something like that. I was sitting in the fair plane there, and uh, maybe it was a Thanksgiving, I don't know, maybe it was a special day. But this, uh, what do you call it, the um, flight attendant, she, she looked like one of us, she probably was. Uh, she was passing this champagne out, filling people's glasses with champagne, I had an orange juice or something. And I was reading a book, and I was newly sober, maybe I'd been sober about a year, and she came up and she said, would you like to drink a champagne? I said, no thanks, not for me, no. I'll have an orange juice. She said, come on, just a little champagne. I said, no, no, no thanks. She said, why not? I said, well, I have to report for work next month. And I don't know how that came out of my mouth. And she said, and she said huh? I said, I have to go to work next month. She said, I don't understand. I said, no, no, do I? <laughs> and I don't understand to this day. Why? I love drinking. For the alcoholic who is out there, the new one, it's tonight. I love booze, and I'm glad I drank. Because I'm not going to be puritanical and say, you know, I hate booze. I love booze. I loved alcohol. And it did great things for me in the early years. It got me into scrapes. It got me in a lot of trouble. But it also got me through things. It gave me a lot of confidence. And I did some things which weren't all bad. You know, there were some that were good. And it gave me a kind of confidence. But it also gave me a lot of fuel for my rage and anger. And I became more and more angry as the years went by. And, uh, of course, I... I drank to quell the anger and to deaden the anger and deaden the feelings, but of course it made me more and more angry. I mean, I could empty an entire room. I go to a party, I could insult everyone. And I've done it. I did it. People would walk out, good night, you know. I'd say to my wife, what happened? She said, don't you remember? I said, no. You insulted everyone in the room. I said, did I? She can't remember. I said, no. And then about the mid-1970s, I... I um, I was, one morning, I was very hungover, and I heard on the radio this, about this weird thing called Alcoholics Anonymous, and I heard about alcoholism, and I heard a woman being interviewed. She said, yeah, I drank for many years, and she said, I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. This was on the British BBC radio. And uh, she said, and I got sober, and I haven't had a drink since. She said, it's an illness. I thought, isn't that sad? <laughs> so sad. What is it like to be an alcoholic? <laughs> And I was doing a television play, I remember, and I was playing an alcoholic in this television play, and I, I had lines like saying, I'm a dipsomaniac, I'm an alcoholic, and I loved these lines I was speaking, I, I'm an alcoholic. It sounded so rich. I didn't realize that I was one. And in this play, I remember it's called The Arcata Promise, and in this play, I say to this woman I'm with, I said, it's, I can leave the tickets when the first one starts. Then I've got to drink more. And I said to the actress I was working with, I said, this is me. I said, it must be terrible to be an alcoholic. But what I was doing was 12-stepping myself in a way. I was being gotten ready for this program. And then I came to America in 1974. And um, to New York. And I was doing a production in New York. And I, it was September. It was just after Watergate, I remember. And I, was, and I remember arriving in New York and feeling I'd come home. And I always wanted to come to America, and I dreamed of coming to America, and I dreamed of sitting in the American bars, and, you know, 
because I'd seen all the movies, and uh, I was raised on American movies. I'd watched them all, drinking Humphrey Bogart and all that smoke, and you know, I loved it all. It was fantastic. And uh, I I couldn't wait to get there. And I came to New York, and I remember the first morning when I woke up, I was pretty drunk, pretty hungover. And I looked down Fifth Avenue, and there was the advice there. I thought, I'm home. And I knew I'd come home. I knew as clearly as anything that I'd come home. And I never had to go back to England, and I didn't want to go back. Um, there's nothing wrong with the country, but I just didn't want to go back. I didn't fit in anymore. And I was already becoming quite a successful actor, and uh, the ironic and weird thing was happening, I was drinking more because I was more and more unhappy. If there's a parable in this uh, success and all that stuff doesn't make you happy, and I learned that the hard way. I wasn't happy, I was deeply unhappy. But I couldn't figure out why, because I wanted to be successful in my job, but I was deeply ashamed of myself and deeply guilty and terrified. And uh, I discovered the magic of the American bars. You never seem to close down here, you know. They were open all night. They were in New York anyway. I used to go to a place called Charlie's and Jimmy Ray's. God. Ah, they were terrible places, but they were wonderful at the time. And I used to go over there and I'd drink and drink until I fell out of the bar stool. And uh, I used to have a head full of wonderful knowledge because I was self-educated because I wasn't too bright at school. But I used to know things that nobody else knew. I knew distances and light years of our nearest galaxies and I knew all that stuff but all the knowledge I had didn't get in there anywhere I used to quote Nietzsche and I'd never read Nietzsche I used to quote Schopenhauer Schopenhauer I used to make up things that Schopenhauer was supposed to have said I'd never even read him one book I did profess to read was Carlos Castaneda's uh, The Thesis of Don Juan but I never really even read him in fact that's what got me sober because I was on my way to New Mexico to find that uh, peyote but I never got there <laughs> And uh, I, I was I was working in this play, and there was a woman called Mary. Uh, she's dead now. Her name is Mary Doyle. So I'm not breaking. And she used to call herself Mary Doyle. And she had an Irish, a wonderful Irish sense of humour. She used to laugh at all my stupid jokes. And and uh, I knew she had the spirit about her. And um, she was a real program of attraction. She seemed to be warm-hearted, and she had this great love. And I know she smoked and. I said, oh, what a wonderful woman she is. And somebody told me, you know, Mary's an alcoholic. I said, really? They said, yeah. And um, she, I, she, I said, she's never drunk. They said, no, she's an alcoholic anonymous. I said, oh, that's really sad. <laughs> I thought, well, no wonder she smokes a lot because she'd have to do something. And she used to smile at me, you know, that A smile. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Fine. Okay. She used to come over the bar with me sometimes and she'd have a coffee and I'd sit there and I said, Would you like a beer? She said, No. I said, Well, oh, I said, You don't drink at all? She said, No. She used to whisper, She said, No. And she'd look pitiful at me and, you know. And so this went on and towards the end of the run in New York in 1975, it was in the summer of 75, and I was about to leave New York and come over to California. I had some work to do here and, uh, I was in a party and I was so smashed that night. And I think I'd been given, I think I'd smoked a bit of glass and I wasn't into that. I was, I'm a just a drunk, I'm an alcoholic. I didn't, uh, I'm a drug addict really because that's all it is. It's another form of narcotic. But, um, uh, I was so smashed that night in such bad shape and I asked Mary if uh, she would, um, help me. So we went out next day and we had lunch and she described to me the nature of alcoholism that it is in fact an illness. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And she said it's threefold, mental, physical and spiritual illness. Spiritual, I, well, I didn't want to know about that. And uh, she said, if you don't take the first drink, you won't get drunk. Well, that's very insulting to a man of my supreme intelligence. If you don't take the <laughs> My little child knows that. So she said, would you like to come to a meeting? I said, no. I'll do it myself. Typically, having asked if she would help me, I turned her down when she offered the help. And, and she said, fine. That's okay. Maybe you're not an alcoholic. She knew damn well I was, because she used to talk about me to her husband every night about how I'd, you know, fallen down on stage and all that. Not exactly fallen down. But I did for six weeks stay dry, and in that period I think something happened to me. Now, whatever this design is, this divine intervention, whatever it is that 
God has plans or whatever. Um, I was very comfortable in those six weeks. I was very comfortable. I felt fine. I had no craving. I thought, that's it. Like Bill W. in the book says, you know, I, the goose hung high and I self-knowledge. That's all I needed. And I was in great shape. I was drinking gallons of tab or diet coke, as uh, tab is called. And I was smoking cigarettes, but I thought, well, fine. I have no to drink. No, oh, got it. Can't be an alcoholic. Six weeks, that's as much as I could ever manage. Six weeks dry. But this time I wasn't white knuckle. I felt fantastic. I had energy. I had energy and power and all that. I was working well on stage and, uh, you know, everything seemed fine. People remarked on the difference. They said, God, you look so well. And I was, wow, fantastic. Energy. I was like a storm troop. I would walk down the street and pop <laughs> The ego and the arrogance, you know. I had it made. And I used to look at Mary with such pity. I thought, those poor woman. She just nodded me. Yeah. And then the last night in New York, I went to a party. And um, it was like a farewell, goodbye party for me. And I was going off to California with my wife the next day. June 1975. And uh, there was a big drinks table full of booze full of alcohol and I thought well I've got a Diet Coke here whatever I was drinking and I thought well one whiskey won't hurt and uh, yeah just a little drop in there and and uh, don't remember any more that night got on the plane next day flew to California feeling very ashamed dehydrated really hung over and bad that way I had the shakes and uh, I tried another few days dry Fourth of July, I went to a party, and I thought, well, you know, I tried the same thing. I was about to pour another drink. And somebody said, ah, ah, ah. This friend of mine, she said, don't take that drink. And I wanted to kill her, you know. I would have taken her head off because she got in my way. And uh, what happened was I, I was working on a TV thing, and um, TV film, and this woman I was working with, um, she was, uh, at the end of the day, we were in Century City. And it was cocktail hour, you know, the beautiful long shadows of the evening sun coming, and uh, a wonderful time, which is the best time for alcoholics. And she had a, a paper cup, a polystyrene cup, and some ice in it. And she said, do you want a drink before you go home? I said, no, 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 I better, I better go home. She said, uh, well, just one. I said, no, no, I, I think I got a bit, I'm trying to, you know, give it a break, you know, I'm trying to knock it on the head. I think I've got a bit of a problem. She said, okay. I said, well, what is it? She said, tequila. I love tequila because it doesn't zip my mind and uh, <laughs> tequila got me into Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> tequila was my best friend because I hallucinated on it and I started getting quasi-religious <laughs> yeah, visions I saw Jesus walking on Malibu Beach <laughs> and I was down in Palm Springs and the stones around Idlewild were talking to me and I was talking back to them <laughs> And uh, I talked to the beach, and uh, when I, I went through the Milky Way and back, and I looked at the stars one night. I was up in Malibu, up in Trancas, and I looked at the stars, and I went right through the Milky Way and back. It was only that close to the Milky Way, and all the stars came out. And I told this person I was with, I said, you know, the stars are really very, very near. She said, oh, really? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, anyway, what happened was... Um, I started losing. So I, I drank that tequila that night, and um, six months later, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I had the worst roller coaster. It was the worst time and the best of times. I was a menace to work with. I was trouble to work with. People who didn't trust me, and I'd turn up in the morning and uh, for work, and people would look at me, Hi, Tony, how are you doing? Okay? And they'd look, give me that look, you know. And I heard somebody say to the cameraman once day, he said, we better get him before lunch because he's just fooling around. They, I said, who are you talking to? They said, you. Uh, because I, was, uh, I wasn't I was fit for anything. And yet uh, the director said to me, said, why are you doing this, Tony? You know, you're so talented. Why? It's up to you, but why? You, they gave me that lecture. You know, why are you doing this? Can, don't you think you should cut down a bit? And I was given those lectures. You know, Tony, it's such a shame you're going to kill yourself, your liver and everything. You're going to kill yourself. What I was more scared of was the driving. You know, I used to get in my car and drive over the canyons. And uh, I, I didn't know where I was going. And I, next, and I would never remember the next day where I had been. And I'd check the front of the car to see if there were any dents or any blood or anything like that. Because I didn't know I could have killed someone. 
police never caught me. I hope no policemen did that, but they never caught me. I was so lucky, they never caught me. And I should have been thrown in the slammer many, many times, and I wasn't. I was just lucky I got away with it. And what happened in the Christmas 75, my wife took off for England uh, to see her folks. And uh, I took her to the airport, and I said to her, I said, uh, I think I'm an alcoholic. She's been very cold on me, because she said, well, maybe you are. It's up to you. And that hurt. And I dropped her at the airport, and I got out the car to let her out. And I said, well, have a good time. In Christmas, she earned you, and she walked away. And I watched her, she walked into that arrival area, or the departure area, and I thought, wow, well, I think I've lost everything. I finally kicked out everything. All my friends have gone. I'm kicking everything out of my life. It's like I'm pushing away the very feast of life. And I got back to my apartment, and I was very depressed, and a couple of days later, I drove down to Palm Springs. I was on my way to... I drove down to Arizona. I was on my way, really, to Santa Fe. I wanted to go down to the New Mexico. I wanted to find Carlos Castaneda. I wanted to find that peyote because Moose wasn't looking for anyone. I wanted to find those magic mushrooms, or whatever they were, and peyote. And Phoenix, and I stayed in some crummy hotel, and I sat there in that bar that night. It was Christmas Eve, and I sat there. God, I just remember this. Yeah, 25 years. I sat in the bar, and they had an old-fashioned jukebox. And I kept putting the court in the jukebox, whatever it was, and I kept playing Neil Sedaka's Solitaire. And throughout the boats and trains, the Burt Bacharach sung over and over again. And I remember these two big guys sitting on, on the bar, so I said, he's going to put the, the same... <laughs> hey, Sir Mr. Can you, can you change the tune? I said, don't you like it? Yeah, but not 15 times. Come on. <laughs> I went up to my room and I felt the despair and loneliness and I, I decided I was going to become a country western singer. I don't know why you think that's funny. I'm not. <laughs> Another great song was Tom T. Hall's Little Children. What is it? Watermelon. The little dog, the dog dog's Little Children, Watermelon and Wine. That was my favorite. It's great. And Billy Holiday, of course. Billy Holiday. But anyway, I went out into my hotel room and I wrote on a piece of paper, I found myself in Phoenix, Arizona. I thought that would be good. Chris Christopherson or Tom T. Hall could sing that. I get around to writing that and I put the piece of paper on top of the cupboard. Now why I put it up there, nobody would find it. probably still there. But I think of sending a message to myself. And next day I, I phoned my wife in England and... Uh, it was early morning their time, and uh, I said, Happy Christmas. She said, you? Where are you? I said, In Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, well, have a good time. She put the phone down and that was it. I thought, Well, I've really lost everything. The one person I could trust in my life has gone. And she trusted me. She put everything she could into this marriage, and I've just destroyed and betrayed everything. And I felt that deeply, and I drove back, uh, made my way back to Los Angeles, and it's December the 27th, 75, and I sat in my apartment in Wilshire Boulevard and uh, had everything going for me. I had a career, and I had, well, I don't think I had a wife left anymore, but I suddenly, my, I was losing my life, and I was aware of it. And I got another bottle of tequila, and I sat in that apartment, and, uh, um, what is that time? The platter song is Twilight Time Again, or whatever it's called, I don't know. And I felt the loneliness that I guess we all feel at that point of desperation. And the phone rang and I was invited to a party and I went to this party up in Holmby Hills and I sat under the piano most of the evening, which is not a place for a social drinker, but that's why I sat. <laughs> and I made trouble and as I, a friend of mine was an agent and he said, come on Tony, it's time you went home. And they stood me on the doorstep of the house and I remember vaguely some people saying, is he okay? And I, they were talking about me and I... I said, I've lost my car. Somebody's stolen my car. They said, no, they didn't. Nobody's stolen it. You left it in the middle of the street where the lights are on, and we saw you and rescued you in your cars back in the apartment. We took it back, and we brought you here for your own safety. I said, I don't remember anything of that. I said, well, you did. And I said, no. I said, well, one thing I do know is I'm an alcoholic, and I deal up very fast. And something went on, the light turned on inside me, and I looked up at the trees, those huge Liberty trees, and I thought, somebody up there really likes me. I thought a movie with Paul Newman, somebody up there likes me, and I thought, somebody up there likes me, because I should have died years ago. 
I should have been killed, or I could have taken out a whole family in a car, you know, in a car smash, an auto smash. And I said this, well, I said, I, um, I need help, and I need to phone our car, anonymous. And I went up to his house, and he got me the number, and I stayed there, I slept on the sofa, I think, and I, next day, he dropped me at my apartment, and uh, he said, well, good luck, and I didn't bother to phone A, anything would be open on Sundays, but I waited until the Monday morning, and I phoned AA, and it was the western, it was the west end sort of branch office of, uh, it was in Westwood Boulevard then. And I phoned, and I said, um, and this woman said, hi, alcoholics, can I, uh, no, can I help you? I said, yeah, my name is Tony, and, uh, I think I'm an alcoholic, and there's a very nice elderly voice of a lady, she said, okay, honey, um, can we just come and get you? I said, no. I said, I'm at the end of my rope. And she said, well, that's beautiful. <laughs> I said, I, 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 I'm finished, I'm washed up. No, that's great, just great. <laughs> I said, I want to, I, she said, well, I said, where are you? I said, I'll come in and see you. So I got the address and I uh, took my car, my poor battered car, after this long journey from Arizona, and I parked it just south of the, those old railroad tracks they used to have there on Santa Monica Boulevard. And I, started walking up that way and um, Westwood Boulevard and uh, I thought maybe I'm making too much of a big thing of this you know I am an actor after all I'm yeah maybe I'm melodramatizing this and and another voice in me went off like a little whisper says just get to the place and do something for yourself for once don't be such a jerk and I went into this office and it was up the stairs I think I remember and uh, I expected to see a bunch of old people in rags holding on to each other so I, I thought what it was I really thought that you know Joe would say to Doris okay Doris you can drink tomorrow tomorrow now we'll come up with you make sure you don't drink too much and then it's my turn tomorrow I had no idea and I walked into this office there were no drunks lying on the floor it's just a nice clean pinewood little office and this nice elderly lady called Dorothy I came in and I said my name's Tony she said hi honey and I thought I'm in with the Christian brigade now and uh, <laughs> tambourines, you know, in Salvation Army. And that's wonderful, but I didn't want any part of it because I hated Christianity in church, whatever it is to do with worship. And uh, she, I sat down, she gave me coffee, she said, and she described the nature of alcoholism. She came up with that same stupid phrase, if you don't take the first drink, you won't get drunk. I thought, these people are simpletons. <laughs> and uh, she said, give me your phone number and, uh, you know, and uh, I'll get somebody over to see you and uh, they'll phone you and take you to a meeting. I said, meeting? Yes, a meeting. I said, is it religious? She said, no. I didn't know why I was calling, because I'd already seen Jesus walking on Malibu Beach. i have been from the Milky Way. I'd seen the angels sing. And so, as I got up to go, she was standing the thing. She sprung the terrible three-letter word on me. And she's a little, woman, little lady, her name is Dorothy, and she said, why don't you just come home and rest, honey? And I looked at her and I that feeling was terrible. I thought I was going to cry. But she said, it's like those swallows coming home to Capistrano. She said, why don't you come home and rest? I thought, I've been out there so long. I'm so tired. I'm so weary. I'm so fed up with everything. I'm so desperately lonely. And, and then she said something which is really terrible. She said, why don't you just trust in God? And at that moment, the gates opened. And something happened. And I grabbed hold of her. Because I knew within a spit, there's like a fast forward microchip, it went zoom, right through my life, zoom backwards. Whoa! I thought, everything I've tried has failed. I thought, why not? G O D. And I'd sat in churches looking at stained glass windows and wondering what it was all about. And I walked down on the street in Westwood Boulevard, it was probably about 10 o'clock in the morning, and, um, beautiful sunny morning and everything brightened up and this big powerful voice wrap around sound said it's all over and now you can get on with your life and it's all been for a purpose so don't forget one moment of it now go about your business and it was that clear and the craving to drink left me at that very moment it's never come back so I take it at that moment I came in contact with a power which is so fascinating and so infinite and so all consuming I was taken to my first meeting that night, and uh, a man called George picked me up. He phoned me up, he said, uh, My name is George, I'm an alcoholic. And he picked me up, uh, he slammed the phone down once he got the address. I thought, damn, I can't stop him coming. And the bell rang, I walked down, there was George, real alcoholic, so I was, hi! Shook my hand, broke my hand. My name's George, I'm an alcoholic. 
And his girlfriend, Lila, she chewed gum on Hi, honey. <laughs> They're all here tonight. We're all here. <laughs> and they sat in that car. I sat in the back and they didn't shut up from the moment we left Westwood until we got to Palisades. I thought I'm really in with the cuckoo birds. <laughs> and I was taken to my meeting and uh, I sat in the chair between these two people, Bob and George, and I've got Don. Here my Don Argon. He had a voice like a truck and uh, he looked like he'd been dragged by a truck on his face. You know, you know. He was the surgeon and uh, the other man was Chuck C. And he said, my, I'm Chuck, I'm an alcoholic. I'll be sober by the grace of God 30 years as Chuck. Brain dead. How can it? <laughs> And I was taken up to see him after the meeting, and I thought, and as I sat there, I thought I'd come home. I sat in that room that night, and there's a big room, and uh, in All Saints Church, Corpus Christi Church, and uh, they must have said things, and I, I sat in that room, and I thought, I know I've come here, I've come finally come home, because all my life, for 37 years, I felt like the outsider. And I knew that everyone sitting in that room, rubbing shoulders with each other, we were all the same, and that we all felt the same, like we were the outsiders, we were the damned, we could never get our act together. And somebody said to me that night, they said, you need never try to get your act together, you never will. And uh, these two men took me out the next day, I wouldn't wrap up in any second. I went out the next day with these two men, and uh, they discussed it over lunch, and I said, I feel so inadequate. And one of them said, have you ever thought of the fact that you are inadequate? I said, no. <laughs> They said, well, you are. You have no power. And it made such total sense. I have no power. I'm powerless. And I have no power of prediction. I can't tell you what's going to happen in the next three seconds. Because I'm not going to shut up any minute. But I tell you that it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And it's the simplicity that's got to me. I mean, I don't, I don't do half the things that I'm told other people do. But I can't describe to you what it's like uh, to not want to drink, to not have any desire to drink, and to get up in the morning. And I don't. You know, I, I I get up in the morning, I go to meetings, and I I go to early morning meetings most of the time, and I get to at least five meetings a week to keep me comfortable. And people say, you, I still go to those meetings a year. Why? Because I die if I don't. They say, oh, come on. I say, no, I do. So I don't explain. I don't I don't have any arguments with people who are not alcoholics. I don't try to explain the program. But that's what's happened. I keep it simple, and I have a lot of fun with this. Uh, and that's it. I can't describe it. I, I, I can't examine things. I can't analyze the big book. I can't sit around being scholastic about it. I know some people are experts on it. And I tried that, and I can't do it. I don't have that mindset because I'm a you know, dummy. You know, I'm not too bright. So I can't examine this. But all I do is get up in the morning and go to bed at night, say, much obliged, thanks a lot. See you in the morning. Go to sleep. It's incredible. I should have been dead years ago. I should have been paying a fortune to psychoanalysts to get this sort of that. And I've come here for free, fun and for free, cost me a dollar to put in the basket. It's the best education, education, a dollar at a time. And I've had the best life I could ever, I can't describe it. People do ask me, this what's like being sober? I said, I couldn't even begin to tell you. How does AA work? I said, very well, thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.